Ecumenical worship means different things to different people. But I think there are two ways in which ecumenical worship can fall down. One is that it can become a kind of competition between different groups to show which one is the correct one or which one does it better than all the rest. Or it can be a sort of demonstration of how worship is done. On the one hand, if lots of groups of people come from different traditions with different shades of theological thought and different patterns of worship, then you can have a kind of competition for space where people are all anxious to present their way of doing things as the right one or the best one. Somewhere in between those, I think there's a path which we try to navigate here in Marquand, which is that we encourage people to bring the particularity of their tradition, to bring the riches of what they know in their system of thought and their practice of worship but to bring it in a spirit of hospitality and to offer it as a gift to all the other people here. We try to avoid making it that we have a rota of different traditions who kind of put on their worship for everybody else to watch. That's really not very satisfying. And we also try to avoid taking out anything that would offend anybody to make it a sort of homogenized common, lowest common denominator because although that sounds as if it would be a peacemaking activity, in the end it becomes very bland. Mark on worship isn't always comfortable. We're not afraid of allowing the challenge of difference to flourish right here in the middle of our worship. It stretches the borders of what you then know to be possible. And also it extends the possibility for a community that's very diverse to be able to build a real sense of community. We make a lot of space in Marquand Chapel for reconceiving liturgical practices. That is to say, understanding how liturgy has developed through the course of history, but then reinterpreting that in contemporary forms. We take a very studied approach to the theology and the history of liturgy, but we also spend a lot of time engaging all our creative gifts in interpreting those liturgical forms we draw together liturgical resources from different places and try to see how they would match up with each other. We draw in drama and poetry. We pursue all kinds of different music from different traditions. Using world music is one of the ways in Marquand in which we create a kind of unique flavour to what we do here. Brother Roger of Teze once was asked why it was that they sang so much in Latin at Teze when nobody speaks Latin at all. And his answer was wonderful. He said, well, you know, when we sing in Latin, it's nobody's first language. And so no one language group is privileged over everybody else. And there's something about the way that we use world music and some of our own invented resources here in Marquand that we create something that's a thread through the middle of all our liturgies. It has a flavour that doesn't belong to anybody, excepting it's our community here. And so we have something that draws us together that doesn't privilege any one of the traditions. All our worship is based broadly around the Christian tradition, but we do also draw in as many voices as we can. Um, so that we have a great spectrum of different voices. And that enables us, even in our pursuit of worship, to understand that one person's vision of God is never quite big enough. One of the things that's central to the way we plan worship here at Marquand is that rather than a team of people putting on worship for everybody else to attend, we try as much as we can to draw in the gifts and the contributions of the whole community. So we constantly look around to find out who has a musical gift or a literary gift, who wants to read in public, whose voices can we hear. And we try all the time to get a great range of the diversity of voices and gifts and talents that this community has and to draw those into worship. So worshipping in Marquand is very much a participatory activity. Like any theological school, we spend a large part of our day in the classroom or in the library. And chapel happens every day here in the middle of the morning. 
But we are very clear that chapel is not a moment to stop thinking and to escape from theological thought. Rather, it's a moment when we integrate what we learn in the classroom and the library into our faith and then from that out into our everyday lives. And when we're planning worship here for Mark Wand, um, we always take time to respond to what's happening in our everyday lives in our study and in the world around us. It's the social and political issues that demand a theological response. Those are exactly the things that we bring with us when we come to worship. And we design our prayers and we choose our songs and our readings to respond just exactly to those things. So our theology informs our worship, but I think it happens the other way around too. Because if you come to worship in the middle of your working day. You then go back to the library or to the classroom, knowing that you're not just studying abstractly, but you're also studying with the knowledge that the pursuit of God, the understanding of mission, and the understanding of how faith actually is lived out in everyday life is at the back of all the study that we do.